Hi, I'm Angela Klepfer Shapiro. Um, I'm an internal medicine physician out at uh, Buffalo Ridge in Erie. And I'm gonna talk tonight a little bit about what it's like to visit a primary care clinic or an outpatient clinic at BCH and to go through some of the safety measures that we've put in place um, to keep everybody safe when they're visiting during this, this time. Okay, so this first picture I just wanna show you, this is um, our uh, clinic um, waiting room. So as you can see, we've removed uh, several of our chairs and um, places to sit in order to encourage social distancing in the event that we have you know, more than one or two people waiting in the waiting room. Um, to that end, I also wanna point out that we are doing everything we can to limit crowding, um, to keep people moving through waiting rooms as much as we can. But in the event that more than, um, you know, a couple of visitors are in there at the same time. They are separated by social distancing by virtue of furniture placement. Um, this is a picture that was taken at 11 a.m. Um, during a, a busy day at uh, our Erie uh, Medical Center. And as you can see, there's nobody in the lobby. Um, we're certainly seeing patients. Um, people are in there. They're receiving medical care. But we're keeping the hallway, the stairways, the um, you know, right in front of the elevator banks nice and clear. And again, moving people right through um, so that they're getting seen and not congregating and exposing each other to, to one another. Um, these are a couple of our patients. As you can see, they're both wearing masks. That's an important thing I wanna point out. So all of um, the patients that show up in clinic, all of the staff at clinic, any visitor to the clinic, so a vendor or anyone coming to maybe do work around the clinic or drop off supplies um, is required to wear a mask. As you can see, uh, these two folks are wearing surgical masks. Um, we also allow cloth masks. Uh, we don't allow gaiters or bandanas to be worn. If a patient doesn't have a mask, they um, are provided a surgical mask, and they can call ahead of time so that a staff member can provide one to them, um, so that everyone is always covered at all times. Uh, just as a nice picture of one of our hand sanitizer stations. These exist all over the building. So you can see this is in between two of our examination rooms. Um, you really can't turn around without seeing a hand sanitizer station. This is very important. Staff uses this before going into any room, after entering a room. Uh, patients can absolutely use it. Um, these also exist in hallways and at um, all of the doors, exits, and entrances to the, the buildings. Um, and this is a temperature and symptom checking station. I believe this picture was from one of our staff members at our Boulder Heart Clinic. Um, as you can see, she is masked up. She has signage sort of explaining what the processes are. She's ready to take a temperature. Um, she has a hand sanitizer dispenser right there and also wipes available to sanitize anything you know, that may be touched. Um, and here she is uh, checking the temperature. We do check temperatures of every patient who comes in, every visitor. If a patient has a family member or a caregiver with them, they are also screened for temperature at the time of check-in. And I'll also point out before I go into some of the screening questions that are asked, uh, we screen people for symptoms uh, both when they schedule an appointment and then also when they arrive for an appointment. So there are two um, points where someone is screened for either recent contact, any symptoms, and whether or not they have any concerns that they've been around anyone who's had symptoms um, in the event that they might be asymptomatic. Based on answers to these questions, we do have various guidelines time frames and precautions put into place if someone answers yes to any question that makes us concerned that maybe they shouldn't be seen in a BCH clinic and need to seek um, care other, you know, elsewhere or via telehealth or, or video, which we'll review in a minute. As you can see in this picture, um, we have a woman checking in and there's a plexiglass barrier between her and the receptionist. As you can see, both of the individuals wearing a mask, their signage explaining um, the process, and um, this is in place at every outpatient clinic, similar to this. So I'm gonna move now to a quick video that shows one of, the patient, one of our patients checking in and going through some of the screening questions that she would answer at the time of check-in to a clinic. Anybody with COVID? No. Have you had any symptoms like cough, fever, shortness of breath, anything like that? No. 
Have you traveled internationally over the last 30 days? No. Okay, you still have Blue Cross? Yes. And are you comfortable using the tablet checking in? Yes, I am. Okay, great. There you go. Okay. Excellent. So as you can see, that was also a quick check-in. We are encouraging people when they schedule an appointment to do an e-check-in using their MyBCH portal. Um, if someone does not have access to a por the portal or doesn't have, have a computer enable to enable e-check-in, they can do a telephone check-in. And so we limit, again, the time that someone is spent in the waiting room and interacting closely with anyone else. So quickly, just to review when it might be appropriate to seek in-person care, so to come into the office for a visit once you've been screened. One of these is for an annual exam. So an in-person physical exam is very important. Often blood work is done. Other tests, such as an EKG, might need to be done. And this is the time of year when, if you're otherwise well, you get a full physical exam from your doctor and where some conditions can be evaluated or even discovered. So it's important to be seen in person Similarly, Medicare annual wellness visits for Medicare patients, they don't always include a physical exam by virtue of what these are. However, one is often done to thoroughly evaluate a problem that someone brings up. Um, oftentimes, if there's a problem brought up, then they can, we can deal with it then with blood work or x-rays or other images if needed to prevent a repeat visit to the clinic. Rash is another example of something that often needs to be seen in the clinic in person. Uh, rashes often need to be touched. They need to be examined closely. Um, vital signs are a very important part of most rash examinations and you know, can easily be obtained when someone's uh, visiting our clinic in person. A couple of other things, urinary tract infections, very common. Oftentimes, uh, we need to do a urine ana analysis or a urine dip um, in order to adequately diagnose a UTI, get downstream culture data. In the setting of UTI, especially you know, with a, a significant um, illness, vital signs are very important to make sure someone is, is doing okay. Other reasons, joint, muscle, or bone problems. Oftentimes, these types of issues require a thorough examination, maybe x-rays to be done. And again, being in person really does facilitate uh, expeditious evaluation. You know, this is kind of broad, but neurological or cardiovascular problems that are new, especially if a thorough neurologic examination is needed, oftentimes an EKG is needed, and, you know, there's really nothing better than listening to someone's heart with a stethoscope. And so these are sort of reasons when seeking in-person care makes a lot of sense, as long as screening has, has gone through. So quickly, I jumped ahead. Um, we do limit in-person visits to just one, pa to just the patient. Um, the reason being is just to limit, again, crowding and to reduce the amount, the amount of people in the clinic at one time. Um, exceptions are made for kids or adults who require a caregiver to be present to help ask questions or get medical information. In that event, parents or caregivers follow the same screening protocols as patients. They follow the same mask requirements and distancing guidelines as patients. Uh, we're going to quickly run through options that we have when it's not appropriate to visit the clinic, um, maybe because the screening tests have revealed that there is a risk that somebody has had COVID, um, has symptoms, or possibly has come into contact. One of the great options we have is using the secure My BCH portal to do a video visit. Patients can see and speak directly to their provider doing this. Um, of course, this does allow for limited visual examinations. Um, but it does allow for some, you know, visual examination so the uh, doctor can actually see you. Family members or caregivers can be present on the video, and this is a benefit because they can assist as needed with maybe simple examination maneuvers as directed by the provider and as appropriate. Other options are telephone visits. These are shorter, um, tend to be 15-minute 15 appo 15 appointments, and they allow time for dedicated discussion of a medical condition. These are often best suited to following up on any chronic condition, maybe that you've already talked about with your doctor or your um, APP, or it could be a new problem that does not require a visual examination, but definitely an option to consider. 
Um, electronic visits, um, th this requires access to the portal. A secure message conversation is basically had between your provider and you um, based on a pre-filled out questionnaire, depending on what your, your condition is. Usually takes place over several days and involves multiple back and forth conversations or messages just reviews a few options that you have if in-clinic or in-person visits don't work. And here is a link um, to the MyBCH portal, uh, which will help you to access and get access to this to um, take part in any of these uh, options. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. O'Hare. You guys are working the clinic, so that's Thanks. awesome. Uh, well, I'm going to talk on similar uh, topics. I'm jumping ahead here. And as Angela mentioned, there are safety protocols in place throughout the BCH system, including the hospital in all areas, including surgery, cardiology, radiology, the lab, mammography, all the imaging centers, and the, as well as some of the uh, other uh, BCH facilities, and as Angela mentioned, at, at Erie, uh, they're obviously doing a very a good job of uh, keeping track of uh, folks and keeping everybody safe. So this is what Angela described um, is really uh, a protocol that exists throughout the system, and uh, and so we're really proud of that that we're able to offer safe uh, and effective care by um, by practicing these safe methods. We do have uh, people that are. Um, uh, sitting in our waiting room. We also have some folks, let me, I think my, uh, there we go. Some people prefer to wait in their car uh, and, and that's, uh, that's perfectly acceptable too. And then we just uh, call you on your cell phone when it's time to come in. Uh, fortunately, this is probably getting maybe a little less common just because there's so much space uh, in the waiting rooms and, and, the, and the new protocols have, have really kept people safe, but this is always an option uh, if you're specifically uh, concerned. Everybody who comes through the door is, is uh, screened uh, by questionnaire, by temperature, uh, as Angela mentioned. And, uh, and again, that is uh, present at every site throughout our systems. And, and they're gonna ask you when you come in a few questions, you saw some of these in the video. Do you have a fever? Are you short of breath, sore throat, muscle aches, congestion, runny nose, cough, loss of taste or smell? Or have you been around anybody with COVID-19? So these, you may even be asked this more than once uh, during your visit, but this is really uh, just a, uh, a way of us being very thorough uh, and, uh, and screening by questions as well as by uh, temperature. Um, and again, just to emphasize this, you are uh, gonna be seeing a lot of people in a lot of uh, protective uh, gear because uh, like, for example, the screen you can see here uh, has been installed again to just to protect the staff and protect you. Uh, and these measures, uh, I think you'll agree with me by the end, are, are really highly effective. Here's the waiting room. These, um, you know, these, some of the chairs have been taken out and Angela showed you that as well. This is outside the, the uh, cath lab. And again, you know, there's, um, there's a spot for your loved one, but not a spot for lots of visitors. So um, we are keeping families together, but we're doing it uh, safely. And I think I have a video I'm gonna show as well. And I'll just pause for a minute and let this run. It's John Meanhouse. I'm a nurse practitioner here at Erie Urgent Care. I just wanted to communicate out to everybody that we are um, doing everything that we can to keep this urgent care a safe environment during the COVID pandemic. Um, we're having uh, patients come into the waiting room just simply one at a time, so we only have one patient in there at a time. Um, we're doing our COVID uh, testing outside um, in the parking lot, so we do all that outside. Um, and then we're um, taking you know, respiratory patients that we see and using this uh, single room here to keep them isolated from others in the urgent care. So, just wanted to communicate that um, we're doing absolutely the best that we can here to keep this urgent care a safe place to come to. Great, that's um, 
good to see we're really focused on that. You know, the, as a heart surgeon, safety is something that's constantly on my mind. The implications of, of proper safety protocols in my practice uh, can't be overstated. And, and I've been asked to talk a little bit about risk, and I talk a lot about risk to my patients, but I, to talk a little bit about the risk of coming to BCH, because there is, for some people, a perceived risk of coming to, to see the doctor. And I would just, there are a couple of things I just wanted to make sure that, that I uh, communicate to all of you. And, and the first thing is that every person that you encounter when you come to visit BCH is going to be focused on your well-being. And that is distinctly different from when you visit the Home Depot or King Supers or even if you're out on the trail or at church. There are a lot of folks out there, a lot of them are masked. But every single person you encounter when you visit one of our hospitals or clinics is going to be focused on your well-being. And, and I think that's a very important distinction. Everybody, every patient that comes in is screened for symptoms or tested uh, if it's appropriate. All the staff are fully trained on the proper use of PPE, masks, gloves, eye protection. And, and so, again, this is, this is unique that, uh, in the community because you... It doesn't take long uh, to be at the grocery store or the laundromat and you see folks with their masks half down or, uh, you know, or, no, or none at all. Um, and so again, every, every person that you encounter has been trained on the proper use of this equipment to keep you uh, safe. I would, I would suggest that there's not a single place in Boulder that has greater safety and security around COVID transmission than the BCH hospitals and clinics for the reasons that I just described. And I think it's the attention to, to detail, the proper training, uh, the, the thoughtfulness that goes into uh, to, to our, our care and our protocols and taking care of each other that has really allowed Boulder to succeed in many ways where other communities uh, have struggled in, in containing this. And, we have been uh, exceedingly fortunate uh, at Boulder uh, for the never really having to reach capacity or anywhere near capacity on, on some of these sick patients, whereas around us, um, some of the other places have really uh, struggled with um, some higher volumes of these, of these folks. Nope. The other side of the coin is, what's the risk of not coming to BCH? Well, my, you know, my practice is, focused on heart disease, and, and I don't have to remind uh, this audience, heart disease is the number one cause of death in the United States every year. Uh, heart disease is generally a progressive condition, meaning you get a little bit and time is not on your side. Uh, it, it tends, disease tends to progress, whether it's coronary disease or valve disease. These are progressive conditions, and in order to treat them, we need to have a proper and timely diagnosis and timely treatment. It, it, everyone knows and can understand that delays in treatment are, are not good um, for, for obvious reasons. And if you look at the, at this slide shows the uh, echocardiograms performed around the United States uh, during the first uh, 14 weeks of the year or so. And you can see as soon as uh, CMS made a recommendation to delay non-essential care, the number of diagnostic echocardiograms dropped off precipitously. And if you look at those gray uh, bars on the left, there are, depending on what conditions you're looking for, five to 15% of those people have serious uh, cardiac conditions. And when those studies dropped off there, those conditions didn't go away. The, there are people who went without a diagnosis or potentially a delay in diagnosis. And, uh, and that has a tremendous uh, potentially negative impact on their, their well-being. And I'll just show you this slide really um, briefly, which, which talks about what is the risk of delayed treatment. And if you look on the right side, these are patients with um, early stage heart failure. And you can see the blue line and the red line are essentially uh, uh, superimposed, meaning that your expected, li your life expectancy or your expected survival is exactly what's observed if we get the patients early. However, if you look on the left side, when patients are delayed, these are uh, class three and four patients who have uh, had a longer um, course of their disease and their, their treatment may have been delayed, the mortality rate is, is significantly higher. So delays in treatment uh, for heart disease have serious uh, implications, and that's why we're focused on so much on getting you safely to your doctor and and safely treated. So I would just say, in conclusion, from the heart standpoint, there's really no safer place than BCH when it comes to uh, 
a COVID, this is a, a very safe place to be. Every person you meet is focused on your well-being. And I think it's safe for my family. They are treated at BCH. I think it's safe for my patients, and I think it's safe for you too. Um, you know, delays in diagnosis and treatment uh, lead to lost years of quality life, and uh, and we can safely see you, and see you quickly. And I just uh, toss up this number here, but we have a nurse navigator that can get patients in to see a heart specialist, generally within 72 hours, uh, if needed. So, um, so with that, I think I will I'll pause and uh, hand off, I think, to uh, Amy. Hi, um, I'm Amy Meditz. I'm an infectious disease specialist. And um, kind of to start off with, I mean, I hope that everybody out there can see how heartwarming it is of this multidisciplinary approach um, to the safety of our hospital here. Um, and that, you know, on this, based on this presentation, this is just, you know, the, 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 just the part of the team approach that we're, we're taking to the hospital um, to make it a safer place um, to come um, uh, to, to, to uh, get your care. So not, um, this has obviously been uh, approached by all of us here, but proper personal protective equipment really equals protection for all. All of our employees are required to wear surgical masks. And I wanna let everybody in the community know, we were early adopters of this in this pandemic. We put masks on our employees very quickly. Um, and it, it wasn't easy. People didn't necessarily welcome it with open arms as um, uh, has people have seen a lot of different responses just in the community. Um, we have come to recognize the true importance of wearing a mask. We also have our employees wear eye protection when caring for all patients. And what I wanna to try to convince you of is that the safety of our healthcare staff really transmits straight to the safety for you. Um, because if our staff is healthy, um, they're not going to transmit anything um, to the people that we're caring for. So really, they're, they go hand in hand. So this is my favorite topic, um, that masks are effective um, no matter what is said in the media. Um, if a mask is worn properly over your nose and your mouth, um, it's effective at preventing the transmission of COVID-19 as well as other respiratory viruses. Um, this year in the uh, Southern Hemisphere, the rate of influenza has been very, very low because everybody is wearing a mask. Um, using a mask, distancing and hand hygiene, this is not fancy technology. Like we're all interested in the robot that might be used in surgery or our new fancy watch. Um, this is old um, technology, um, but it is effective technology and is basically one of the main pillars that we're using to uh, control this pandemic. So this is a little bit more detail about what we're doing when patients are admitted uh, to the hospital. I do hear from my patients oh, I wanna do everything I can, I don't wanna be admitted to the hospital. But what I want to assure you is the hospital is a safe place to be admitted. So I wanna to try to give you more information about what we're doing to help you feel more reassured about that. So first, um, our patients who have COVID-19, we rapidly identify them. We have an in-house test that identifies that they are infected in less than two hours. This is a great difference from the beginning of the pandemic. It was taking a week to identify these people. Um, so this is a huge advance to the, to the safety of our hospital. All of our patients have private rooms. This is not new to this pandemic. We've had a private room-based hospital um, since the hospital was built. Um, and this has been an important basis of all of our infection prevention practices long before COVID-19. Um, our patients also are asked to wear a mask on admission 
um, when interacting with their healthcare team, and when leaving the room when they're being transported. Because source control is another important part of preventing transmission, and as everybody is probably aware, um, infection can be without symptoms, and it's kind of one of the Achilles heels, heel of the uh, pandemic. So um, having a patient wear a mask is another measure uh, of preventing transmission in our hospital, all patients. Specific to our patients with COVID-19, um, we minimally take them out of the room. They, they are clustered in a single area of the hospital. And again, our healthcare personnel wear specialized um, personal protective equipment. Um, again, this trickles down to safety of other um, uh, patients and our employees. Preventing the infection of our healthcare personnel prevents infection to others. So, um, you may be wondering, we're a small community hospital, um, but we have all the standard therapies that are available to patients with COVID-19 um, that larger hospitals might have. Um, so we have ICU care, we have ventilators, um, we have medications, we have convalescent plasma, steroids, remdesivir. This didn't just fall into our laps. This was the result of the work from my partners at uh, Beacon Center for Infectious Disease, the pharmacy, the administration, the pulmonary team, the anesthesia team, um, and many others at Boulder Community to make this happen at our community hospital, to be able to take care of patients who become sick in our community. So this is a chart about the testing that we've performed at Boulder Community Health. Now, this is the testing that uh, we use to, when we swab your nose, um, it goes into your nose um, and we collect the sample. This is measuring the virus directly. Um, it's called a nasopharyngeal swab. Um, you may, it, it, it has, it's a little uncomfortable. It lasts for about 30 seconds total. Um, and this chart is kind of displaying what we've done. We've almost swabbed, collected 14,000 swabs. And to give this a context, this has been about 30% um, of the uh, tests performed in Boulder County. Um, we're very proud of that um, accomplishment. This chart is divided into uh, the reason for testing. Um, there's a concern uh, for COVID-19. This would mean somebody has symptoms, they might have had an exposure, um, it could include people that are wanting testing because of travel reasons. Um, that's this top category. And I've divided that into two things. One is people that are getting admitted in the emergency room or urgent care. These are more likely to be people with symptoms. I mean, they're going to those areas for a reason. Um, and among those people, the percent positive is 86 and you compare this to the community drive-through testing. So we got community drive-through testing started on May 7th. They've tested over 7,000 people, also something we're super proud of. Um, and the percent positive is a little bit lower, but this is a more heterogeneous group, not all symptomatic, so you expect a lower percent positive. If you take these together, this does, of course, track with the percent positive that we're seeing here in the community. The second category is asymptomatic screening. So at the end of April, to get surgical um, cases going, um, we started pre-procedure uh, screening of uh, scheduled surgeries. Now I wanna be clear, we're, we're screening these surgeries not because we can't handle operating on somebody who might have COVID that needs it. Um, we have protective equipment, we know how to handle this in the operating room. We're screening people because if you have COVID-19 and don't know it and you have an operation, that operation could have a worse outcome due to that. So we've screened over 4,500 people um, and only 14 people have been identified, um, reflecting a fairly low percent positive. Again, this does reflect our general community's lower rate of infection um, due to the things that you guys are doing um, and wearing masks and keeping physical distancing. We're also testing all women who are being admitted for um, delivery of their baby. Um, so um, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, and just for a point of reference, in the last seven days, we've identified 14 new positives. So 
among those cases that I mentioned that were identified you know, and admitted to the hospital, we had 65 cases hospitalized at Boulder Community. Um, there, when this graph was made earlier this week, we had one that was admitted to the hospital. We've had a death rate of 12%. Um, and just to be clear, the majority of these individuals elected to not have escalation of care. Um, take, they didn't want to be taken to the ICU or put on a breathing machine. Um, they just elected to, to let nature take its course. Um, but then you can see the majority of individuals were discharged. We had two cases that were transferred to a higher level of care um, because they had a special type of, they needed a special type of support that we couldn't offer them. Um, this is a rare instance to need this. So um, one of this, this is a little off topic regarding the safety of our hospital. But because it's such a pressing question and people get nervous that we're testing people and it's not really re reflective of, you know, that, that it's accurate. But I want to assure you our testing is accurate. It is good. So this is a graphic and on the left is where the droplet exposure occurred. So that means you just got exposed to somebody who had COVID-19. That's day zero. So the average time to develop symptoms is five days. So just to kind of put this all in, in context, you can see the little viral particles are getting you know, more abundant as you reach to day seven. That is the peak amount of virus that you'll have in your nose. Um, and it's millions of copies. The tests that we're using at Boulder Community detect five to 500 copies. So millions are in there. So we only need 500 to detect. Um, so the test is accurate. Um, the other thing that's, I'm, I'm taking you to the next level with this graphic. If you see more to the right of this graphic, the pieces of virus are breaking apart. They're just pieces of virus. What I'm trying to show here is that after day nine, there is robust data showing that you're not infectious anymore. But there's these pieces of virus that remain in your nose for up to three months. So testing people to show that the infection is gone is actually not that helpful because the test is just measuring the genetic material, not if the virus is still infectious. So um, that's another point that a lot of people have questions about that they get a lot of anxiety because they're still testing positive. We're not testing people anymore um, after they've um, been identified as positive for COVID-19. So admittedly, there's some small chances of false negative testing. Um, this could be poor sample technique. At Boulder Community, all of our testing clinics, the, the staff is highly trained on how to do this properly. Um, as an infectious disease staff, we um, trained these people, the staff, to collect this properly. You could collect the sample at the wrong time. So if you were exposed today, I mean, getting a sample today is not going to be helpful. Um, another reason that the test could be falsely negative is the infection is actually in the lungs and not up in the nose. Um, this is mostly implicated in people who are admitted to the hospital. Um, there can also be lab errors. This is true for any test, um, but we have a certified lab. We have a very standardized process for labeling. This really occurs very infrequently. Um, I just wanted to show you a picture of what our testing clinics outdoors look like. These are the signs and people pu pull into the parking lot. Um, and there's a whole instruction process with signs and everything. It goes really smoothly. Um, we actually test up to nine people every 10 minutes. Um, so it's a pretty quick process. It does require an appointment. So I'm also going to talk about another common question about what is the difference between quarantine and isolation. This is a common community question. Um, and it is relating back to the safety of our hospital because if our staff has an exposure to somebody with known COVID-19 outside of work even, if they meet this criteria, they have to quarantine. And what quarantine means is that you were close to this person 
less than six feet for more than 15 minutes, and they had known COVID-19. Um, you have to quarantine for 14 days, stay at home, away from others, measure your temperature. You may note that there's no masking mentioned here, and that's because the CDC um, has some uncertainty about the general public's ability to wear a mask properly. Um, I, even if people are wearing masks, the risks if they were closer is probably greatly minimized, but this is what the guidance is out there. But if this, if one of our staff has an exposure, they will not be coming to work, they'll be quarantining based on the CDC guidance. Isolation, on the other hand, is when you are known to have COVID-19, either based because you had a test and you didn't have any symptoms, you were being screened for surgery, for example, or you actually had symptoms. Then you stay at home for 10 days, um, and you if you had symptoms, you can't have a fever for 24 hours. Those numbers, that number 10 days, you may know has changed over the time of this pandemic, but now we know after nine days, you're not infectious. So that's how that, that number got reduced. So BCH is a safe place to come. We know how to manage infectious diseases, and we've been doing this long before COVID-19. We just had to scale up what we were doing. Um, but I want to emphasize what everybody else has emphasized. Do not delay care. It's kind of a unique thing for an infectious disease specialist because COVID-19 obviously can cause a fever, but there are many other infectious diseases out there that cause a fever. Um, and you ha they, they could be life-threatening, and you have to come in to, to seek evaluation. Um, cancer screening is another thing that is important not to delay. I have a personal story that I have a higher risk of breast cancer, and it was time for me to get my MRI a couple months ago. Um, it was a very smooth process. I checked in from my car, I walked into the hospital, I got my screening questions, um, I wore my mask during my MRI. I felt very safe the whole time. Finally, um, of course, an infectious disease doctor is going to mention this, you cannot delay vaccines. Preventable diseases such as influenza are important to continue um, to seek vaccination. Here on the right, I want to encourage the uh, Boulder County to keep it up. Um, it's just been so heartwarming to live in a community um, that really um, is supportive of our hospital, uh, wearing a mask in public places, physical distancing by six feet, avoid the crowds, meet up with people, it has to keep it down to less than 10, be outdoors, and use your hand hygiene. Here is me, um, Alicia Maltzman, and Mark King finishing the Be Strong ride, which raises money for um, the Integrative Center um, at the Cancer Center um, after we had finished our virtual ride. And that wasn't a virtual ride. It was our on-demand ride. So um, I appreciate your time, um, and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maddox. I'm Michelle Sternitsky, and I'm Associate Vice President of Nursing. I work predominantly within the Foothills Hospital. However, I do have some areas that I oversee in the clinics as well. Um, I just want, really want to start off by showing my gratitude to all of you, the community. Um, our patients and our community have really had an outpouring to our staff and um, to the team that's working so hard to protect you. So we've received letter letters to baked goods, to donations to the foundation, and I just really want to recognize that. So thank you all for that. So really my role um, is working with the leadership team um, in combination with our infectious disease team. And we've been working around the clock pretty much to ensure that we are following all the latest protocols and safety standards. Um, this started, of course, back in March. And, um, and we continue to do this on a daily basis. So we are constantly monitoring the new guidelines that are coming out um, both from CDC to OSHA um, to also our state guidelines. And we are ensuring that we're keeping up with the latest research as well. 
Um, and every day we discuss our community numbers and any barriers that we foresee. Um, we are also keeping a very close eye on all of our admitted patients. We're looking at our own um, COVID positive patients in house and um, also about how our staff are doing. So tonight, I'm really just gonna reiterate what the other physicians have um, talked about tonight about keeping our patients and staff safe um, within our doors. So right from the moment that our staff enter the facility, they do the same thing that our patients do. They are screening for symptoms of COVID-19. So they actually have to attest prior to starting their shift that they are symptom-free of COVID-19. In addition, they all receive training on exposure. So they are aware that if they have any type of exposure to someone with COVID-19, they would contact us, and then we do as what Amy was describing, we put them into a quarantine for 14 days and continue to monitor them for symptoms before we would return them to work. So when our staff enter the building, of course, they enter with their mask. Um, and every patient encounter that they have, they are also wearing eye protection. Um, as Amy pointed out, we did adopt this very early on. So all of our staff are actually putting on their mask before they even get to the door. Um, and they wear entirely throughout their shift. Um, minus the, their break times. Um, and even during their breaks, we are very careful about our social distancing policies and we have really minimized um, congregating areas in the hospital, including our cafeteria, um, one person per table. Everyone really honors this. This is very important to all of our staff because we wanna protect you and each other. So as you can see in this picture here, we have everything from the mask to eye protection to our isolation gown. And putting these on seem pretty simple. But what I can tell you is there's actually a technique to this. And we've done extensive training with all of our staff throughout the hospital on how to place the gown, the mask, the goggles on safely and then also remove them um, very carefully without any kind of contamination. On an annual basis, um, we also complete infectual infection prevention training. Um, so we do that normally. So this type of equipment is actually normal for us. We um, handle infectious disease all the time. I will say, of course, we've heightened our use because of COVID-19, um, so we've gotten even better at using this. And this protective equipment, of course, creates that barrier between our patient and our staff and really ensures that each encounter that you're having, that you, your care is very safe, that we are protecting you, and we're also protecting the staff from any germs that may cross over. Our staff in that um, infection prevention um, training, they also learn how to do proper hand hygiene. They learn how to disinfect. And also just monitoring for their symptoms and making sure that they are completely symptom free before they return to work. So on to our cleaning procedures. Um, we follow all of the federal and state guidelines. So CDC, of course, is um, one, of the, um, one of the regulatory agencies that we follow. And um, we look at the product recommendation list that they have, and that's how we determine which disinfectants to use. We use a lot of checklists. So very similar to in a pilot um, who's getting ready to take off, um, we go through a very systematic approach every single time so that we do not miss a step. We've really increased the frequency of cleaning all surfaces. We pay very close attention to all high touch surfaces. So areas like that would be counters, around sinks, um, doorknobs, um, any entry and exit point in the building. We also have checklists for our daily patient room cleans and also our procedural surgery areas, 
um, between every single patient use. Our environmental services staff, so you can see the team there on the screen, and clinicians have been very specially trained in both the protect, personal protective equipment as well as the cleaning techniques. We've also trained them in chemical safety because of course, with all of these new disinfectants around, we wanna make sure that they're handling them safe. So in conclusion, this pandemic has really heightened everyone's awareness of our environment and really providing the best and safest care for you. So now I'm going to share a video from one of our patients um, during a visit to the Foothills Hospital. Hi, my name is Kirsten. I'm a resident in Boulder, Colorado, and I'm very pregnant, as you can see, 41 weeks pregnant as of tomorrow, waiting for this baby to come out. And throughout my whole term, I've had no issues or concerns coming to any of either Foothills or currently Erie to get checkups. Um, I feel like the hospitals and clinics are doing a great job making sure everyone's safe and healthy and doing all what they need to do to make sure we stay safe and healthy in these current times. Great, thank you guys. That was a great presentation. We did have a few questions come in while you were speaking and I will start asking you those now. Um, we're gonna start with Dr. O'Hare. And the question is, can you talk a little bit about what specific heart conditions are affected directly by COVID? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I would, uh, there's a couple things to talk about there. First of all, you know, that I think uh, we, we did talk very briefly about delay and delays are, are terribly risky. So um, this is the biggest concern in my mind. There are other um, uh, inflammatory conditions that can be related to COVID and the heart causing uh, things like uh, myocarditis or inflammation of the heart. Uh, collections of fluid around the heart are something that we um, see from time to time. And these are all can be detected by uh, by routine uh, examinations. So uh, there are clearly uh, cardiac implications uh, to the, to these infections, but uh, the good news is they that those things can be detected quite easily by uh, standard echocardiography um, measures. So I, I think that's one. And I I would just want to add one more thing, since uh, since since I've been tapped. You know, a lot of folks might say, what, what can I do? You know, what, you're sitting at home, what can you do? We're so fortunate to have uh, such an excellent care in our community. I would just like to make a plug for the foundation. Uh, this has been stressful on many people. They're frontline workers. If you're wondering what you can do, uh, I, you can support the BCH Foundation, which helps fill in the gaps and support our, our frontline workers. So I just want to get that uh, plug in there quickly. Uh, but thank you for the question. Dr. Maddox, this, this one's for you, I think, so help me. Um, there's been a lot of reporting regarding the flu shot and that a person should have it now or as soon as possible, but given that it's only effective for four months or so, is now really the time to get it? Yeah, so um, thanks for that question. Just to repeat it, um, people are just asking about the timing of the influenza vaccination. Um, I get this question every year um, about is this vaccine going to last me through the entire season? Um, the most important thing is to get the influenza vaccination. The information that it's going to wane significantly at the end of winter um, is not uh, based in a lot of data. Um, so the immune, immunogist, the, the, the ability of this vaccine to develop an immune response has been improved with time. So it's becoming, it's, it's developing a more robust immune response. So as soon as you know, it's available and convenient for you to get it, you should get it. It should not be delayed. Thank you. 
So here's a couple of, actually, this is like a three-part question about masks. Uh, first part of the question is the possible transmission rate be differential between a surgical mask and just a cloth face covering. Second part is when should children start wearing masks? And the third part is the efficacy of the droplets and so forth, like how, how, how much does it stop? And Dr. Maddox, you covered this in your part of the talk, um, but maybe you could cover it again, how much, this, how much the face covering actually does stop transmission. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, what we've shown in studying a particularly healthcare environment as we've moved forward, um, the interest in studying masks has obviously significantly increased. Um, and what we've shown is uh, almost no transmission in a healthcare setting um, when everybody is wearing a mask. Um, this is the easiest environment to study. Um, so, how I usually describe the difference between a surgical mask um, and uh, a cloth mask um, is that a surgical mask has some bidirectional uh, filtration. So um, it's mostly just containing my droplets, for example, but it is also filtering some towards me as well. Um, so it has this bidirectional capacity where a cloth mask um, is not going to have as much of that. It may have some depending on the type of cloth. Um, it's not blocking 100% of the droplets. I mean, that's the easiest way for me to describe it. And that's why we want people also to distance. <laughs> Um, because it's not 100% perfect, um, but it's pretty darn good because in a healthcare setting, we can't always stay six feet separated. I mean, just the nature of our jobs um, requires us to get closer together sometimes. We have to move a patient. Um, we have to collaborate over some you know, picture or radiograph. We have to be in the <laughs> operating room. Um, so um, it's still demonstrating that they're highly effective. Um, and I'm going to um, turf the age that it's appropriate um, for children to start wearing masks. Perfect. So at BCH, we're requiring masks for kids um, under or over two years of age. So we actually have just at BCH in particular, these absolutely adorable little masks um, for kids when they, they come to clinic or if they have to come with their, their parents to a visit. Um, really, they're, they're very cute. Um, so in terms of, uh, you know, in the general setting, when should kids be wearing masks? Um, I, I would want to... <coughs> <laughs> probably check with some of my pediatric colleagues who've looked at more of that data. I would say if kids are able to wear them, keep them on, they're breathing comfortably, and they're not pulling on them, touching their face more just by virtue of wearing the mask, if they can start doing that at age of two, great. Um, wear them as much as possible. We know that kids probably are reacting differently to this virus, but we do know that they can still transmit this virus. And so, you know, similar to adults wearing masks, it's important to have kids wear masks as much as they can tolerate and as much as they're able to do it safely. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, next question. Given that asymptomatic people can still be contagious and temperature is just one symptom, why does a lack of a temperature make it okay for folks to enter facilities? <laughs> I, I'll, I'll just take a stab at that. I mean, you know, I think that's a, it's a good question, but it, it is a little bit of an oversimplification because the, because the, um, uh, it's not just temperature screening. And, and there are some places that screen only on temperature, but I can tell you that the, uh, if you're coming to the hospital, there's much more, you know, there's the questionnaire. And all the employees, every single employee uh, that signs in at the beginning of their shift also signs sort of an online affidavit that says they've not traveled, they've not been exposed, and they don't have any symptoms. So it is really, in the, in the hospital and clinic setting, it is really more than 
just temperature, but temperature is really the only completely objective um, method that we have at this time. So it's a combination of things. We do the best we can, and actually it works, seems to work pretty well. Thank you. Michelle, I believe this question would be for you. Uh, what is the current evidence information suggests around surface transmission, contact with surfaces transmitting COVID-19? Sure. Um, so at this time, um, you know, as I was speaking to, we do follow the CDC and OSHA guidelines in terms of what products to use for disinfection. So I want to share that because there certainly has been um, mixed research out there about it. Um, I'm actually going to ask Amy to help me a little bit with responding to what that research has said. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, surface transmission is, is still considered a minor uh, modality of transmission. Um, I, I still think that hand hygiene and, and increased recognition of keeping your hands clean is a priority. Um, and, you know, keeping surfaces clean. Um, the surfaces and these items are called fomites. Um, that's the terminology that we use. Um, but I would say this is a minor uh, modality of transmission. Um, we don't really think, for example, on packages, um, this is not an, an effective way of transmitting the virus despite it being isolated. Um, there's a lot of factors that actually lead to actual transmission of a virus, not just its presence on a particular surface. Um, so I think that I, I, I think it's good to continue to think that the, these areas are important and we should keep things clean, um, but we should really focus on the distancing and the masking. That's, that's the droplet transmission is really the majority of the causes of transmission. Thank you. I think we'll make this the last question. And I think it's for you, Dr. Mattis. Um, You've already addressed this, but what happens if someone goes in for pre-surgical COVID test and it turns out positive? Are, are you necessarily going to cancel surgery in that case? Um, yes, so if um, you're going through the pre-surgical screening process, um, our test turnaround time is between, it's, it's probably averaging about 36 hours. Um, you will be notified of that result and your surgery will be canceled even though um, you know, you had no symptoms. Um, you will talk to um, somebody about your test um, and the health department will uh, contact you. Um, you will have to be isolated for 10 days. If you had no symptoms, you are just isolated for the 10 day period. And after that period is over, um, you have your surgery with no repeat uh, surgery screening. Um, because as I mentioned, there's no point um, because the virus particles can still be there for three months that are not infectious. So after that 10 day isolation period, um, your, your surgical team can reschedule you. We've come to the end of our time. A recording of tonight's lecture is available at bch.org slash livestream. You will receive a post-lecture survey by email tomorrow. Please take a minute to fill this out. Thank you for joining us and have a great night.